a resident 40k expert. Uh, how's it going, oh, Joe? Uh, yeah, thank you for throwing that label at me. Now <laughs> the chat's going to talk massive amounts of shit while I fuck up names and events. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. As, as long as you're worse at it than me, we're good. Oh, I, I will be. Yes, expect that. <laughs> well, thanks for coming on the show today, buddy. I really appreciate it. I've been waiting to do this show for a long freaking time. Um, the uh, This is a 40,000 subscriber show, so thank you all for watching and for some reason uh, tuning in like every night to watch me make a fool of myself and uh, and hopefully make a fool of other people. Um, but today, You'll be doing that tonight when we talk about 40K and I screw <laughs> everything up. It's going to be good. Well, that's the goal. That's the goal is to finally get you in a gotcha moment. Uh, oh, you're going to have plenty tonight, yeah. To expose you for who you are. Uh, welcome, welcome to that. And our, our other guest is, uh, he'll be back in just a second, but it is a border prince. And hopefully he will keep us, uh, he will keep us on track with the lore. Um, there's not really a plan for this stream, guys. We're going to just be talking 40k. I hope to talk a little bit about the, the actual lore, about the story, what, what makes it interesting to people. But I also, uh, if my guests are willing... Um, oh, and I'll I'll wait till he he saddles up for this because this is a blindside. Uh, hey, welcome, Border Prince. How's it going, man? I'm fine, thanks. How you doing? Oh, we'll be live, are we? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, we're we're live. You you missed it, but it's okay. <laughs> it's very important. I need coffee. Yeah, sorry. No, that's that's fine. You take your coffee. I've got my uh, I've got my uh, Glenlivet Nadura. Um, Good choice. Uh, the El Rosso Sherry Casks. I strongly recommend it. Uh, but so what I was saying is I, I want to talk about the lore and the story and uh, the world of Warhammer. But I also I want to talk about um, I guess there's like a socio political aspect that's always hovering around this toxically masculine uh, franchise where women where women are not only hated and murdered on the on the regular, but but they're disallowed from the positions of importance. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's constant. Yeah, it's true. But uh, I, I I, I like to call it the smell barrier. Any hobby which you know, requires <laughs> requires more dedication on the part of the user uh, usually has coupled with it uh, a more heinous smell of the players. So you've got right. like you've got like your Pokemon kids, kind of normalish. But by the time you get down to D and D and Warhammer, like you need to put a fucking clothespin on your nose when you're walking in the hobby shop. So <laughs> I think that's what's keeping the woman away. I don't know if it's socio political more than that. It's might be a contributing factor. Yeah. Yeah, well, what I do, what I do is I, uh, I went down to the local mechanicus and I got rigged up a harness with some of that Febreze spray stuff, like right up here. And whenever I walk in, if someone gets in front of me, there's a motion sensor and it just hoses them down. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's how I keep the nastiness at bay. Um, but no, it, I mean, it, it is a nerd hobby. And in any sort of nerd hobby, uh, you've got, well, it was built by guys. And uh, and now that's that's not OK anymore. You can't have you can't have men building these these worlds because men build worlds where men are actually cool and uh, and women are there, but they don't necessarily have all of the same cool jobs as the men. And that that is a problem in 2019. And we need to fix it immediately. We need more women getting horrifically maimed and murdered by tyranids uh, and, <laughs> and uh, chopped up by orcs. And, uh, uh, it, 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 you know, honestly, it feels like it's more like sponsored events that this is kind of happening at. Um, I cannot recall for the life of me any time that I've been in a hobby shop, whether it was playing Magic or D&D or even kind of, you know, uh, playing around a little bit with Warhammer and stuff like that, where women were really present. It was always some dude's girlfriend. I'll be honest with you. It was, yeah. You maybe had one or two female players who were actually really into it and they kind of blended in. But for the most part, it was pretty much a guy thing. Um, and I, I think it's mostly, especially like in magic and shit like that, you, you'll see kind of a tournaments. It's more like kind of PR stuff, but the hobbies it, themselves, I think are kind of purely masculine. I, I, I haven't seen really anything to contradict that. At least that's my hot take on it. No. And that's, that's the interesting thing is that all of the pushback on this stuff comes from the predictable people, right? It's, it's people who it's, uh, it's women who are longtime fans of the, franchise who get basic things about it wrong um who don't you you never see them at events they're not they're not showing up at these things and then of course it's men uh white knighting for them like that's the ultimate thing is is it just separates out the uh the people who do care about the the hobby 
uh, from the people who just care about the hobby and then the people who care about the hobby plus are trying to get into the pants of the women who will never sleep with them anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you know, pretty much. I mean, there's a really great image macro from uh, like on the V boards and stuff uh, that sums it up really well. Uh, I don't have it saved or anything, so I can't share it. But basically, it's a group of guys together playing a game. It's some kind of hobby, and then one of the guys brings his girlfriend with, <laughs> and she doesn't really want to play the game, but he wants to get her involved in it. But she just likes the attention, and so she brings a few of her female friends who just kind of want the attention, which attracts guys that don't want to play the game but are interested in the girls. And by the time, you know, this evolves to the last panel of this little, like, image comic and stuff, it's a bunch of casuals together who don't even really like the hobby or are familiar with it. <laughs> they're just there to try to date each other, and they've driven away all the normal players because they're smelly and getting in the way of people hooking up. And I think that kind of sums it up, really. Yeah, and I think uh, <laughs> that's kind of what Halo did, right? That's what Halo did. It brought video gaming mainstream and then in some ways ruined it. Uh, but you know, I guess, I guess to, to each their own. Um, if you want to, if you want to be one of those guys who, who buys a woman to bring to Warhammer stuff, then that's, that's more power to you. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh let me, <laughs> let me adjust my microphone. Some people in chat are saying it's a bit loud. Let me see if I can. I, I turned you down a bit. I turned you down a bit. Uh, oh, okay. If you got it, it was, on your end, then. Yeah, it's, uh, it was my fault. Um, because some of my guests do come, come through really quiet and you actually, uh, you actually sound good and are voluminous. So you're fine. I've, I've adjusted it. So it should. That's, that's a nice way of saying obnoxiously loud. See, that's that lawyer speak <laughs> we all come to appreciate. Yeah. I'm going to turn you down even more now. No. <laughs> Before we move on, did you want to, should we broach the subject of female space Marines? Is this something yes. that we want to go into? Oh, yeah. 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 That's, I do want to talk about female space Marines. So should we have space Marines who are only good three out of four weeks, uh, Terran standard? Um, <laughs> <laughs> or would oh they oh would they all That's... would they all be blood angels and just be like really really vicious for that one extra week? <laughs> is, is that the the red thirst? <laughs> oh, God. There seems to be a big push to that. A lot of people want to do this female space marine thing, and again, it's it's exactly this. It's the you know you read some of the law books and you have a female character. She's a she's a strong independent woman, um, which is able to punch a bloke a full-grown like veteran warrior in the face and knock him on his ass and it's like well it's, it's unrealistic you know it really takes you out of the moment and the thing with the space marines is you know they're supposed to be this warrior order of knights you know they're a brotherhood of knights they're being indoctrinated to be super soldiers and you know you're sticking women in there it instantly ruins it it takes away that whole aesthetic you know it's gone so i don't know what they're thinking with it i think it's just i think it's marketing I think it's big. It's a big marketing push on them. They think they're going to get more women players because there seems to be a drive for that now, across all industries. But GW is starting to go down that route now. Oh, uh, Border Prince, you you can't see this as well unless you have the stream up. But um, yeah, I you're you're way off on the side of your frame. Oh, am I? And and it's my my thing has it cut off, so you got to be right in the middle. So either. Oh, there we go. There we yeah, go. Thank you. Center. Thank you. Sorry, uh, that again, it's it's all my garbage format that I have. But, you know, this is this is my show and you will abide by the rules, sir. I follow uh, the rules. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. The, the female space marine thing is weird because they so Warhammer has all sorts of ways for men and women to uh, equalize in whatever sort of capacity that they want. Like you have you have uh, female assassins <coughs> that are that are wildly powerful because of the the augmentics they can. Uh, and in some ways, the assassin cadres are pretty interesting because they can be as strong as space marines or as fast as them with uh, well, or so, even yeah. even faster. Yeah, the the Eversor assassins are hilariously overpowered. Um, but uh, but that's never good enough. Right. Like that, because on the on par of the lore, the space marines are the cream of the crop. And that's what that's what matters. <laughs> pretty Sorry. much, pretty much. My art guy, my art guy's yelling at me. He says, I made this garbage format. Thank you. Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome. You're welcome. No, it, it looks good, but my, my operation of it is substandard. Uh, but yeah, the, so you've got this, uh, you've got this weird thing where, where they're trying to push women into like, it's, it's never enough. And that's what people, oh, I got the mouse on the screen. Uh, that's what people, of course, in, in all of these movements are noticing, that there's never enough apologizing. There's never enough allowance. It has to be beyond parody. 
uh, to to be satisfying for them. Um, which I is mean, saying something when it comes to 40k, which yeah. is in itself so absurdist and almost you know pure parody of kind of that whole genre, that kind of idea to to take it a step further. But well, it's, they're taking uh, it seriously. That's the that's the well, thing. yeah. That that's a crazy thing. I mean, it, it really is patronizing how they're doing it. I I think they're approaching trying to get women involved in this like they would uh, trying to play with a cat. They want to dangle <laughs> something. They want to dangle something <laughs> shiny like keys in front of them, like. Oh, the Space Marines, right? That's nice and shiny. You can cosplay as that. Won't that be cute? Like that's the mentality they're taking with it. <laughs> what we need, what we need is uh, we need a resident MRA on the stream to actually suggest that that's also how you get women into things is to dangle something shiny in in front of it. Just that because women are like cats. There so, you go. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> no, but so that that is an interesting thing, and it'll be interesting to watch it develop. Of course, the funny thing with all of these. With all of these genres, is you have um, you have implications about uh, who different races may represent as far as uh, Star Wars runs into this, right? With, like the Trade Federation or whatever, they're obviously supposed to be Asian, um, and and could mainly considering they were all voiced by Asians uh, in really weird and uncomfortable ways. But you gotta uh, get that China money. You gotta get it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and 40 K has similar things. Uh, orcs. I don't even know, uh, if orcs are supposed to be uh, a particular race or not, but there's lots of speculation that they are. And that's, that's because they started off as these representative microcosms in, in sort of a small work. And I think all of these things end up, they never plan for how big they get. So then when they get big and they have to enter sort of this idea of mainstream, uh, mainstream, awareness and 40k uh, the games workshop has definitely pushed that with all of the licensing they've done over the past couple years i mean any any video game studio uh could get a license for for warhammer uh ip a any video game studio oh, yeah. who wanted it and that was a big... warhammer monopoly now it's mental yeah yeah i definitely want that although isn't, <laughs> isn't broadway cadia and and didn't cadia <laughs> like cadia broke so that's a uh, it's a terrible or no, I think Broadway might be Tara, but I think Park Place is Cadia. Um, so it's <laughs> what a what a disaster that is. So they're but but yeah, they're they're definitely pushing to get it into the mainstream. And I think that's because uh my understanding is that in the late nineties and early two thousands, um, Games Workshop was really, really in a vulnerable position. They were losing money, uh the property wasn't doing well, they weren't managing the IP well. And that's when I think they started with Black Library, really firing up the the publishing aspect of it, and then mm -hmm. launching IP uh, launching IP licenses all over the place. Some of them good, and most of them god awful. Um, but I I buy all of them just in the hopes that there's one good game that comes out of it. Yeah, keep 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 hoping. I, <laughs> every, time, every time I buy a 40k game, I always say, you know, in the back of my head, I'm like, it's not going to be good. It's not going to be good, but uh you know hope wins out and so i i purchase it and then i'm like uh i'm looking mm. forward to, well it's not even 40k it's just warhammer though but they've got that diablo like game coming out so maybe yeah. that'll be maybe that that looks good maybe that'll actually be really really well it looks okay it looks okay the mechanical one that came out recently was okay it's just everything's yeah, sort right. of just okay you know battlefleet gothics came out come out recently the second one and it's okay but you want something truly great. Like the days of Space Marine or the first Dawn of War, you know, those are glory days. And I don't know. I don't think we're going to get anything on that caliber again soon. You know, but the uh, the second Dawn of War, I know a lot of people didn't like the campaign. I sucked so bad at the multiplayer uh, <laughs> battle version. Like I would, I would start a game and I'd lose in like three minutes. So I was obscenely discouraged from trying ever again. But um, the last stand mode was really fun. Uh that that was the one where you had one hero that you controlled oh, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and the other two players would control one hero and you had like a wave assault thing. You had to get through 20 waves of enemies and it got wildly difficult past like wave 16. And, uh, and that was a fun game. I really wish they would have continued that. Of course, with Dawn of War three, instead they just, uh, they just like jerked off on a copy of Dawn of War two over and over and over again and then <laughs> sold that or something. I, it's such a, such an ugly disaster of a game. Um, but last stand was fun. Dawn of War one was great. It was really, really fun until suddenly everybody just stopped playing one day and all the servers kind yeah. of depopulated. Eternal crusade was good up until they released it. Then it turned to garbage. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I do have hope for chaos Bane. Um, I played the beta a little bit. 
I played Inquisitor. I put I put probably fifty hours into Inquisitor and uh Is this Inquisitor Martyr? Yeah. And it Yeah, it, yeah. And it it's just slow. It's like this is a Diablo style game. You should be killing hordes and hordes of enemies. It should be fast paced. You should not be sitting here taking like five swings to kill one guy. And then when there's 40 on screen, that was actually the Diablo three problem originally was how eventually it got too tedious to play. And then uh, they they changed that around and made you made you into a probably too strong now. But then Martyr is the same thing. It's this boring like yeah it's it's a tactical action rpg i don't want that i just want the action part yeah, yeah. and uh yeah. chaos bane seems to be better because you're swinging you're hitting multiple enemies you're killing hordes of things at a time and then you have to focus down mini bosses and bosses that's that's kind of how those games should be i just hope the difficulty on that is good uh, like my the thing that turned me off at diablo 3 aside from just the always online crap and the, the auction house and stuff like that was uh, the difficulty, like if you go to play that game on normal or even just hard or whatever it is, um, it is ridiculously easy. Yeah. Like you'll find yourself, you'll you'll almost be zoning out. It's like you don't even have to pay attention to what's happening on screen. It's so easy at a certain point. And yeah. like I, when I'm burning through a boss in 20 seconds, I'm like, something's really wrong here. And then you go and read and they're like, yeah, you have to set it at the most extreme difficulty. But oh, well, you're going to have to start over. You can't you can't switch once you started the campaign. So I was like, oh, God. Did you play uh did you play Diablo 3 early, Jim? No, I did not. No, Man, I did not play Diablo 3 early. I when stayed you, away from it. When you got when you when they first launched it and you got past the hell difficulty or whatever and you unlocked the infer uh in I think it was called Inferno or Torment or something. Um you got to the first one, it was really difficult and then when you got to the second act of that uh Inferno difficulty, you got you got one-shotted like pretty much everybody. Uh, and it was it was brutal. It was so freaking hard for a long time. That was great. That was great. It got really, really tough. Although the, you know, same thing on normal Diablo three was pretty easy. Once you got to the hell difficulty and above, it started to get hard. And now, of course, it's now it's just like a, a click to get to level 70 as fast as possible. And then the game starts, which is a weird play, but they do it. But it's been around for, you know, like six, seven years now. So. People don't yeah. care about the backstory anymore. It's just I want to try a new thing. No, they're they're all excitedly looking forward to Diablo Mobile. I mean, I think we're all yes. <laughs> fingers fucking crossed for that. Who needs a proper sequel? Give me that mobile shit. All I yeah. do all day is I call up Google and Samsung and I'm like, your phone better be ready. Your phone better be ready for my Diablo, my Diablo mobile game. Because if if I get lag, frame lag on, on your stupid hardware, I'm suing you. Um, that's, that's, that's the majority of my day, uh, until I go on stream. So, um, I'm really glad that they're doing that. <laughs> it seems like a wise choice. Now, did you ever play any of like the early games? Like I remember playing, uh, Space Hulk back on Saturn and like that game was just fucking unmerciful. Mm. Oh yeah. I, I didn't play it back then, but I bought it on steam a while back and tried to play it. I got just murdered immediately immediately uh gene Steeler comes up and just just rapes your guy immediately oh yeah no it'll straight fuck you into the dirt yeah <laughs> <laughs> i've got to go to the uh the, the best game ever uh was shadow of the horned rat i don't know if anyone ever played this but it was it's the hardest most difficult game you've ever played in your life i've never um, played that it's it's amazing uh, you, you can't find it anywhere now there's a there's like a rip version you can download and play but it's the most difficult game ever it's it gives you missions that you can't win you literally can't win. It puts you into a mission, so you die a bit, and then you have to carry on the campaign. But uh, it's like in the fantasy what it's in the fantasy setting, so you, you lead like a mercenary arm and you go all the way around the map. But uh, it slaughters you. It's the hardest game in the world, with mm. hands down. You know. Was it a PC the, game or? It was on. They released it on like PlayStation One uh, back in the day, but it was PC originally. But uh, it had a sequel, Dark Omen, which is a bit more accessible. They toned it down a bit, but the first one was it was brutal. Completely brutal. A I lot of people in your your chat are screaming out "Path of Exile." Yeah, I mean that's fucking fantastic. If you're looking for Diablo done right, I suppose after the disa uh, disaster that Diablo three was. <laughs> I uh I don't play Path of Exile. I I tried for a little bit and then I just quit because I I was unfamiliar and I just don't have a lot of time to to play games. But, you're waiting uh, for that mobile game. I got you. Was, yeah. <laughs> you, put, you put Path of Exile on my phone with some monetization behind it. Oh, I'm there. I'm there. I love my microtransactions. <laughs> uh, or better yet, I hope it's an idle game so I can just gain experience while not doing anything. That's the most fun. 
Uh, no, so I, I, but I've watched a couple videos of this one guy who his whole purpose is to act uh, to just wreck the game. Um, so he he builds these, he makes these builds where basically every time you do a, you get a cast on hit or cast on ignite, and then he sets up the build to ignite constant your enemies constantly, and you get hit constantly by your own stuff. So y your screen is just raining. Uh, pixel effects or particle effects all the time and it crashes the server uh, over and over again. So um, that's funny to me. I love when games can be broken in that way. So I should probably try Path of Exile. I played a Grim Dawn. I played Grim Dawn for quite a bit and that was fun. It was more Diablo 2 style. Than, uh, yeah, I never heard of Grim Dawn. It was, it was pretty good, but, but, uh, back to the 40 K or Warhammer, I guess, universe, there was a, there was a PC strategy slash four X old world Warhammer game back in the late nineties or early two thousands. I can't remember if I was still in high school or not, but, um, it was, uh, you had your little regiments of unit units and you would do the real time strategy battles. Yeah. This is dark uh, omen. Yeah. Was it Dark Omen? That yeah, yeah, yeah. Where yeah. you'd have the two heroes come together and the, the battle would stop around them and they'd circle out and let the two heroes fight. And you oh, had no, to... no, uh, that's a different one. That's, yeah, that's the one they had that trailer. You remember the, the badass trailer they released with uh, Warrior Priest in the woods? Yeah, yeah, and, uh, yeah. And fighting a bloodthirster. I mean, yeah, uh, that, I can't remember what it's called. Chaos Gate? No, something it, like that. It wasn't Chaos Gate. Chaos Gate was a 40K turn-based yeah, yeah, yeah. tactical. Um, no, this was, this was Old World. And uh, man, I, I didn't know anything about the old world Warhammer at the time. So I was getting stomped, but it was fun. Um, man, it was weird. I don't know what that was called. Ah, God, I got to find it. Uh, it yeah, that's, a, that's an, another one I'm unfamiliar with. It's it, well, the, the, the game that I don't know the name of and can't remember much about at all is the one you're unfamiliar with. <laughs> yeah, so well, well, when, you're talking, it's like, when you're saying it's like a 4X. Mark, like, of, I, Chaos. Kind of, Mark of Chaos. Mark yeah, of that's Chaos. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a that was a fun game. Um, I didn't play it too much. I had it. I, sh I I probably have it in a box somewhere. I should find it. But uh, that was tough. That was tough. Uh, yeah. Anyway, anyway. Um, so I, I guess I have questions. You guys are my guests. I'll interview you both. Uh, what uh, what got you guys into the lore uh, or into Warhammer 40K or Warhammer, I guess, uh, Border Prince? Do you want to start? What what got you into this stupid world? Uh, it's pretty prevalent over here in the UK, to be honest. Um, it's the kind of thing you go to school and people bring in their Warhammer to the, uh, you know, the games. You know, you can bring in a board game for school special day or whatever. So, yeah, I just got into it that way and I've been into it ever since. Uh, and then I stopped when I was 15 because uh, I discovered booze and women. And, uh, yeah, and then I came back to it when I was approaching middle age because uh, I've got sad. So, yeah, that's it, really, yeah. Yeah, there you um, go. There you go. So that's wait. pretty much it, yeah. I, I played the uh, I played in a couple of tournaments, uh, fantasy tournaments and stuff back in the day. Played a bit at X-Wing as well. Um, but I've always been around that sort of, you know, uh, role play, games clubs, game shops, all that sort of stuff. And, uh, yeah, now it's, it's mostly just the law because I don't really have time. Although I bought Blackstone Fortress recently. And uh, that's, it's pretty immense, to be honest, as a game. Um, yeah, I'm really chuffed with that. I mean, the quality of the work they're doing now, GW, for all the things we might say about them, the, the models that they're producing, are, they're astounding. It's, it's fantastic work. They are the top tier. I mean, that's where, why they are where they are, because the quality is just there compared to other uh, games companies. But yeah, that's it, really. There's, there's nothing super interesting to say about it. I've just always been into it, and I've always read the books since Black Library started. Um, so yeah. Yeah, I think uh, I think Games Workshop had their come to Jesus moment and said we either have to fold or we have to work really hard and make this make this a real property that people want to invest in, not just because they're nostalgic about it, but but we want to attract new players. And they really seem they for for all of the weird stuff they've done with Age of Sigmar and and stuff like that. Oh, don't, don't, don't even get me started, <laughs> we're, man. Oh. We're, we, we don't have to go there, but but for what they did, uh, I've got all the Age of Sigmar books up behind the special editions no, up, up top. No, They're that pretty, heresy, man. man. I, had to, I had to buy them. I had to buy them. <laughs> They're too good looking. But but for all of that, they I mean, the, the 40K stuff that they keep putting out, the models keep getting better. Uh, to me, the new lore stuff, and we can talk about Vigilus and stuff in a little bit, but yeah, yeah, happy to. That yeah. that's all very. I mean, I think I think it's great, and and doing the Horus Heresy 
was probably the smartest move they could have done. I really hope they do a series on the Unification Wars. Yeah, um, definitely. I mean, they've got to go there. Um, and But they get as soon as the heresy's over, they're going to do that whole period afterwards where they're sort of pushing the, the traitors back to the Ayatera. That's going to be uh, the scaring. That's going to be a big series because uh, we're going to get to see the, you know, the Iron Cage, the Iron Warriors, like slaughter the Imperial Fists, um, all that sort of stuff. It's, it's all coming. But the Unification Wars would be amazing, especially reading these Primark novels now, these short ones. And you get, it's like, uh, it's grim, dark Star Trek. They go to a new world every, every, every book and you right. meet this new society that needs to be slaughtered and brought into compliance. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Yeah, there's not enough rape, though. Uh, so, so Jim, <laughs> Jim, <Jesus. laughs> uh, Jim, I, you kind of covered this, but do you want to expand a little bit? Like what brought, what brought you into this, uh, this stupid universe? Cause I mean, it really is stupid and that's part of the appeal to it in my opinion, but what, what kind of really attracted you to it? Uh, well, yeah, like I was explaining earlier, I mean, when I was younger, I was into magic and D and D and so you'd go to a hobby shop, you'd go to a card store you'd usually have a large group of people playing these games together. Um, and you'd always have a smattering of like one or two guys who were into the, the Warhammer stuff, right? The 40 K stuff, they'd have armies and they would do their own thing kind of off in the corner and it would eventually catch your attention. I, I explained to you, you know, kind of when we're off air, I tried getting into it, the, the board game aspect of it. Cause I was under the impression that you could buy it pre-made pre-painted. <laughs> I didn't understand. I didn't understand that after you spent your hundreds of dollars, uh, that you had to assemble it, glue it together, sand it down, paint it, you know, lacquer it, make it look nice and fucking pretty before you even really sat down to learn the game itself. And I was like, okay, that's a bit of a investment for me. But I did like the lore and that I, I found that appealing. I kind of fell out of it for a while, but what renewed my interest in it, I, I guess more recently, as in like the last five or six years, was on the TG board, they had a uh, kind of a theme that they used to go through where they'd write sci-fi uh stories called humanity fuck yeah uh which is it's not in universe in 40k but it's kind of going off of that you know like uh where humans are the central figures and they do kind of this uh bizarre or extraordinary shit and it was you know it, it reminded me of that and that kind of drew me back in and so now i've started getting back into the, like, the novels and shit like that um and i just i i like it i like the kind of uh, the lore the world's uh, the races, and I, I I like the what if scenarios. Like to me, 40k is to sci-fi what D and D is to fantasy. Like a lot of it really is player dependent. It's your imagination, what you're willing to invest in it, how you're willing to look at the lore, and where your mind takes you from there. And I like I like games and hobbies that make you put that investment in, where it's not just the developer holding your hand and saying we've explained everything. You can't think outside the box. Here's 40k. It's fucking insane. It's grim dark. There's crazy <laughs> shit happening everywhere. We've set down, you know, uh, some basic stuff, but you feel free to go fucking crazy with it if you like. And so I love that aspect of it. Yeah, that's that's one thing I like because uh, once you get into 40k and they have the second founding, and now now a third founding with the Primaris stuff going on, um, and and Robute coming back, you have infinite possibilities for. Or uh, you can make the chapter however you want to make it. And you can make them as stupid as you want to make them. Uh, you can pick the color scheme you want. You can have them have uh, weird mutations or whatever. Like, um, oh, God, I was going to make a joke, but I'm not going to. Uh, you can you can have them do you can have them do pretty much anything. And it really does leave a lot into it. Plus, you I mean, that's not even counting uh, the really deep lore stuff that they they were just in. They were just competent enough to not say anything about. Um, I don't know. Uh, I, I get in these stupid 40 K holes where I'll like go to Lexicanum, uh, and re and spend like an entire day reading a stupid wiki about, um, you know, like some legendary weapon that, it, cause I'm such a power nerd <laughs> that I will spend <laughs> all day reading a wiki about some cursed sword, uh, wielded by whoever. Um, but, and then there's, of course, there's, there's a couple of channels out there that really do a great job on the lore, uh, border Prince, You have a channel that talks about Warhammer quite a bit. Um, but there are also channels like, uh, like 40 K theories and yeah. uh, that guy's, that guy's great. Um, it goes Ar deep. Yeah, yeah. yeah, Arch Warhammer of course does some stuff. Uh, Lutine 09 does uh, really amazing videos. 
Um, and there, there are others too that I've watched. I can't think of their names, but the, the 40 K theories ones just consistently blows my mind with how deep some of this lore goes. Uh, <laughs> and I'm, I'm pretty sure that they could never run out of material. That's, that's what I actually, I mean, when you, when you talk about the, the ancient ones and the original, uh, and the, the Necrons and that stupid war that, that they had going on. That stupid war. That was a fantastic war. A fucking well, space dragons made of energy. How do you not, how does that not write itself? Exactly. Well, I, I mean, it's, it's so, it's so absurd, like the whole thing. And then they, they of course bring them back with these, these shards of the Catan or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they brought it back and they even bring it into 40 K when um, like in the ultramarines omnibus, which I, I give a strong recommend because Uriel Ventress is pretty cool and, yeah. uh, and his companion Pisanius. But um, there uh, when they encounter the Nightbringer, a shard of the Nightbringer, um and, and he just, he just straight murders pretty much everybody around. And uh, that that whole actually that whole series, uh, the Graham McNeil Ultramarine series is is a lot of fun because uh, they go yeah. all over the place. Um, but, yeah, that's that's what got me. What, what got me into it? Uh, I showed it off stream, but um, this is the first Warhammer book I bought. It was this uh, Eisenhorn omnibus. I was walking to uh, Barnes and Noble during my lunch breaks at uh, Thrivent Financial in Minneapolis. I would I'd walk through the skyways and uh, go read. And then I'd buy food on the way back and eat at my desk. Um, but I saw I saw Eisenhorn, who here's how grim dark he is. His face is paralyzed into a permanent scowl by the torture he received from an Eldar. <laughs> like <laughs> he could fix it, but he doesn't want to. Right. It's brilliant. Yeah, he doesn't want to. It it helps him with his job too much to be eternally pissed <laughs> off. Uh, <laughs> so that that immediately attracted me to the show uh, to the to the whole universe and. And ever since then, I've been I've been just hooked on it. I I'll spend uh, hours and hours watching stupid videos. That's how I wind down at night, as I watch 40k stuff and and uh, read about it. But um, I actually I, I do something similar. You mentioned uh, Luton Double uh, O Nine, right? I think that's yeah. the YouTube channel. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. Yeah, he does like hour long videos and stuff. Those are mm. fucking phenomenal. Like they're real. I, like I could I I could sit and binge watch those. Yeah, his his ones on like the the emperor and the deep history about. Uh, how the emperor came about. Oh, that was another thing. When I when I was first, uh, not when I was first getting into 40K, but when I'd been reading the books for about a year, about a year, I read Paradise Lost, the, you know, the old, the old book, Paradise Lost. And, uh, and I noticed the parallels, of course, between the emperor and, and this was right when, this was right before Horus Rising came out. And I had been reading wikis about the backstory of the emperor and, and the primarchs. And uh, I read Paradise Lost, and I'm like, weird. And then uh, 40K is like, it's like a grim, dark uh, sci-fi retelling of Paradise Lost. And so, of course, I'm, JW stole something. That's yeah. terrible. Like, no, 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 no. They, <laughs> no I, I think they re-envisioned it. And nah. uh, they, they borrowed from a. Now, let's be clear. Paradise Lost has been public domain since like 1680. <laughs> It's, it's okay for them to borrow that one. But uh, no, they've got this, you know, they've got this emperor who's supposed to basically represent God and they've got a bunch of Primarchs being the, the original angels and Horus takes a bunch with him. But like the parallels were good. And, but then the story diverges wildly. Um, it diverges wildly because, because Horus ends up, well, maybe it does. I don't know. With Horus kind of damaging the emperor permanently, but then being mm. wiped off exist, out, out well, of existence. See, I don't remember Paradise. I don't remember uh, there being <laughs> Lucifer partying up with a bunch of filthy Martian uh, machine worshippers <laughs> <laughs> and well, fucking up this whole plan. I don't remember that part of there's, Paradise Lost. There's liberties taken, Jim. There's liberties <laughs> taken. No, so Horus represents Lucifer, and then he takes he takes well in the because it has to be fair for Games Workshop. He takes half of the traitor or he takes half of the Primarchs with him. But in in Paradise Lost, it's a third of the angels. You know, Lucifer takes with him, and they wage they wage a war against heaven that's basically unwinnable. They get cast out into this uh, chaotic realm of of fire and and death, which uh, would be I guess relegated to the eye of terror. And uh, and and you have you have a lot of parallels, but it I mean it goes wildly off. The rails, but this was before the heresy really started being fleshed out in the way it was in the books. And my understanding, reading a lot of the forewords of the books, is that they loved that the the lore was thin enough 
that they could make pretty much whatever story they wanted so long as yeah, they, they gave them freedom to do whatever yeah yeah they it's they great. they just had to get to certain plot points but outside of that they had a lot of freedom to to move to them um but man that that it just caught me at the right time so that's what got me into it uh and over my shoulder i should point out is the picture bonitis uh furry <laughs> porn artist bonitis drew of me as an inquisitor so uh, that's, <laughs> apparently I'm is the, is the fur suit under the armor is yeah that, well, is that where it is? we'll just works, say yeah. all the all the fur is down south buddy <laughs> there you go. I've got my I've got my uh, my my goat legs my goat legs down in the uh, under the power armor they don't fit down below so sh should we have a lore conversation a nice in-depth one about why the emperor is a bitch and should be pulled off life support should should we jump right into that yeah let's do it probably let's do it probably with the stagnation of the empire and how it's falling apart what is it a thousand psychers a day he needs to keep that throne fueled yeah but who likes those those chumps anyway <laughs> oh nobody nobody likes nobody likes the underclass in 40k i i love the idea of um you know the sacrifices i also like servitors the idea that you're just going to take people and make them into kind of machines because you don't want to deal with ai fucking you again it's really it's true it's true you, it's a danger you just you just lobotomize whatever whatever person you know broke some minor law and they get penalized to be a servitor for like the next 400 years where the, <laughs> they're conscious enough to know that their life is garbage but they're not conscious enough to fix it oh it's see, funny see now i love it your chat's screaming heresy right now but the way i see it Almost every other race that exists in 40K has a solution to the problem of the chaos gods. With the exception of humanity, which is just kind of sitting with its thumb up its ass and like this stagnant kind of weird neutral ground of we don't want to advance too far because we don't want to fall back into what happened in the past. But, you know, like not really having a solution. Like this is how I look at it, right? Maybe you guys can tell me where you diverge. Uh, when you're looking at like the tell, right? Uh, what is it, the different cast they have where, you know, the speculation is, oh, it's kind of like um, uh, their mind, they're brainwashed, right, right, into being part of the collective. So I always find it fascinating to think about, like, okay, well, if you've got these different gods that exist in the Immaterium, right, and they come about through emotion and thoughts, right, that's kind of how they were formed in a way. If the Tau can brainwash people that are part of their collective, what's to stop them from brainwashing enough people and then collectively putting an emotion out to create their own form of a god to battle the Immaterium? So oh, go uh, again. I don't know how, how current you are with the Lord, Jim, but you see, the Tau have created a god of the warp. There's a Tau god of chaos now. Oh, um, there is? Shut the fuck, is there yeah. really? Okay, yeah, fantastic. It's, it's All right. been created. So the Tau are going to go into this big expansion and they sent this massive fleet out and they got stuck in the warp. And uh, the demons came and ate everybody who wasn't Tau because the Tau haven't really got a sort of spirit, really. Their, their soul spark is quite low. Oh, so so the, wait, then. so the space, commun <laughs> the space commies have no soul? <laughs> yeah, yeah, but the, the, best, the best bits to come. The best, the best bits to come. So they're left. The demons start to notice them because they're there and they start coming for them. And all, all of a sudden, this giant being comes out of the warp and it's like... Uh, you know, in The Simpsons, when Mr. Burns becomes like an alien, it's like that, but with multiple arms, and every arm is like the arm of a different race, with like a symbol in their hand uh, to represent all they, the different they races. They've created the, into their the collective. god of diversity. The They've time. created the god of diversity. <laughs> yes, that is it completely. And that the god comes crazy. along and saves the Tau fleet. But the best bit is the Tau get onto the other side of the galaxy, another chunk of the galaxy, and they're there. And they're so messed up with what they've seen. They see this like this entity that's been created from their beliefs in a, you know, a utopian greater good, the God of the greater good. They're there and they're disgusted and it's like, it's, it's scarred them all. So now you've got a faction within the Tau empire on the other side of the galaxy who have started genociding all of the other races they encounter. Every world they go to, they slaughter humans, they slaughter everybody. And when they make contact again, they start killing all the other races again. Uh, so they get like assigned crew contingents, you know, like normal. Um, these crew contingents all of a sudden start getting uh, mysteriously um, slaughtered and stuff like this. And yeah, <laughs> firing squads start emerging. Um, yeah, oh, wait, been, the, you're telling me brilliant. the Tau are building space ovens? <laughs> pretty much, pretty much, yeah, pretty much. Um, yeah, so you've got this other, you've got this entire faction now that they're still Tau, they're still devoted to the greater good, but they think that the only way to preserve the greater good is to kill everybody who isn't Tau. So this god dies in the war. 
So yeah, that's where we've got. This is this is peak grim dark. It's beautiful. So the, I, their, I, their ideals the, have corrupted them. The I love that. I, that's fantastic. It's the brilliant. Tao it's created. Fantastic. They literally created Stalin, Mao, and Hitler into one one. Yeah, <laughs> one yeah, yeah. Giant god. <laughs> it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. Do, so do, you think they, they're gonna, uh, do you think they're going to have like the Tao God of Diversity end up fighting? Oh, what was the name? Is it you need? The Eldar yeah, yeah, yeah. Worlds. So is it going to be like, is it going to be like some god of diversity that's all messed up because they ovened all the Ser- or Serbian races? I guess. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> well, <laughs> wait a minute. Scrub. So they have that. They have a uh, in the, in the in the Uriel Ventress Chronicles. They they already have a greater demon that is literally a train. So do they load up? <laughs> do they load up the uh, the warp bound races on the demon train? <laughs> Send them straight into the space ovens. Well, oh I don't, I don't think they're planned for that. But yeah, I can see where you're going. Yeah, <laughs> oh, that is that is amazing. Yeah, I, I, honestly, God, I did not know the Tau had already reached that step. But see, that's where I'd imagine it, it, it going. And then you've got the Eldar working on, um, you know, their craft world god. You've got orcs, which are basically the power of positive thinking. <laughs> that exists and if they believe it enough it's going to come true so i could imagine them doing well and yeah. then what you've got necrons and uh the katan or however you pronounce it i mean uh, what is one buried on mars i think isn't that part of the lore the void dragon yeah, the void yeah. Dra- and the best thing about the void dragon is that his influence so the effect he's had on humanity being so close to the martians is the reason why the martians went all techie um it's, it's like corrupted them for over the generations that's the idea you know he's his influence on them. He's he's underground in this this area, and it's it's warped the minds of the tech priests, and that's why they became tech priests, and that's why they worship technology in this way. Um, you know, the flesh is weak. It's that that ethos has got into them. Um, yeah, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. I, I, yeah, I love how the Martians they'll per, they'll perform rites and rituals for a fucking toaster. Right? Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're so into that. Um, and I always found it so bizarre. You know, like when you're looking at is it the Iron Man, you know, the AI kind of uh, fall of humanity. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and still, but they like they, they want to look for, they want to look for that lost technology. There's still like that allure to go find it. Yeah, um, the SDC so, is the ideal. You know, I mean, right? They want that template. They want to yeah. be able to, you know, 3D print uh, super. <laughs> well, that's all it is, isn't it? It's, it? it's actually it's, it's our technology given ten thousand years advance. You know, it's it's beautiful what they've done. I don't know whether they intended it, but whatever that they intended is. It's what, all coming to fruition, you know? They're really just trying to find the Fleshlight STC. Let's be real. <laughs> <laughs> Once they find that, it's a downward cycle for humanity. That's what mechandroids are for, man. You just got to wrap it around. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, so if, if you look at it, you've got the Necron and their living metal with their space dragon gods, essentially. You've got the Tau creating their diversity gods. You've got the Eldar working on their own god in a crafts world. I mean, like, and then the orcs just are orcs doing whatever the hell they feel like and, uh, you know, destroying everything for the fun of it because uh, positive thinking carries the day. But like humanity, you know, and the emperor is just kind of, it, it feels, again, like it's stagnated. I, like, it, you know, he doesn't even really have that strong of a grasp on Mars. You know, it, the horse heresy kind of, I think, highlighted that, didn't it? Yeah. There, there's a, there's a, there's a series, uh, there's a book called um, Titanicus by Dan Abnett. And it goes pretty deep into the sort of the, the theological problems between um, the various wings of the Mechanicum. Um, like some of them believe he's the Omnisire, he's the he's the physical representation, the avatar of the machine god. And then you've got the other faction that don't believe that at all, you know, if you think he's an imposter. And in this Titan Death novel, like they discover a bunch of information from the heresy, and it and it makes clear that, you know, back then no one viewed it like that. It's just morphed into that period, in into this belief as it's gone along. And then they start a massive civil war between themselves. And it's it's nice. It's, it's, uh. well, and even what I, I, you know, like even looking at, um, uh, Tyranids, right. Mm. Um, their way of doing, uh, uh, space travel, like faster than light stuff. They don't use the warp. They use some like no. weird they fold space. Yeah. Oh, right. Right. So you, you'd think again, like if you're the emperor of humanity and the warp has been the thing that's caused the most distress and using it and being a part of it or having it influence you is just a, a huge load of trouble. And you've got this weird alien race that can do it uh, a different way. You'd be like trying to hunt them down and like reverse engineer that somehow. But again, they're so stuck in that mindset of we we don't want to advance. We don't want to go down the path of what happened before. Now, like I hear that's starting to change a little bit, but I, I don't know. Well, now that uh, now that Robute is back, uh, the 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 Imperium has been given some direction. Also, mm. with uh, with Cadia falling and the 
half the galaxy or the galaxy being split in two it's really causing troubles by the way here's here's titanicus uh oh i'm yeah. jealous yeah, i'm jealous yeah. Uh, yeah. Even the hard cover. Cover. yeah, yeah. you uh you go you go down to your little british bookstore <laughs> or whatever <laughs> i'll get my paperback off amazon in a day so I'll <laughs> but uh but yeah the um the, it, it's really it's really interesting the the theories around the emperor and i'm i'm curious what what games workshop or black library is going to do because at some point they have to address this question uh the question jim is is bringing up is is very prudent because they have to figure out, okay, how do we, uh, you, we've either got to bring the emperor back or we've got to kill him. I know what they're going to do. They're going to, they're going to come up with their own kind of, um, Deus Ex Machina, right? And it's going to be something like, oh God, you know, Hey, we found out if we, if we sacrifice a hundred thousand psychers a day, rather than a thousand of them, we can, we can transfer the emperor's soul into a new body. So let's go, you know, genetically engineer some more kids. And just uh, hop them over one. It'll be something like that. I really hope they don't. But I, I don't know. I mean, there's a whole thing about the Emperor's Thrones breaking down. Um, like recently, they tried to a, a group of Inquisitors tried to um, bring a homunculus, uh, a Dark Eldar, you know, uh, mad doctor, onto Terra in order to fix the Golden Throne and repair. You know, like this this is what's going on, sort of in the internal politics of it. You have got all these factions trying to fix him, but um, like I said, with Gilliman returning. It's very odd. Uh, it, uh, Gilliman is completely disgusted by all of the Imperium as it stands at the moment. You know, he's disturbed by it. So uh, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. Um, that thing, though, used to be the old law. That's what people would go in towards. It was the, there was a whole like Illuminati sort of subplot going through with all these uh, children of the Emperor who were uh, perpetuals, you know, and uh, they were going to reincarnate the Emperor in one of their bodies. But I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. Maybe if Vulcan comes back, he'll get reincarnated as Vulcan. Uh, I, I would love. I would love Mars uh, Mechanicus. I, I'd like them to find a template <laughs> to build their own Omnissiah, and then to literally pull the life support on that motherfucker and take us into a wild new direction. And maybe have the Tau come in with their diversity god and start just you know uh, going nineteen uh, forties Germany on the universe. Pretty much. Yeah. Pretty much. <laughs> See how things turn out. Uh, I just want to point out that the the train I men mentioned was the Omphalos Daemonium, and it was literally powered by an oven. So that uh, is amazing. <laughs> we got that in there. Well, oh, that's the thing as well. I just want to say, Fabius Boyle can cloak uh, can clone people. This has been confirmed. So maybe he can just clone the Emperor at this point. Who knows? Yeah, he cloned he cloned like a bunch of Primarchs, but they all seem like chumps. There's something yeah. missing from them. Mm -hmm. Like, cause uh, he clones Horus even, and Abaddon comes up and just straight murders him. Like, it's no big <laughs> deal. And uh, he was cloning he was cloning fa cloning Ferris Manus left and right. And and uh, what's his face? Uh, God, why can't Fulgrim? I Fulgrim. Yeah. Fulgrim would just kill him. Like it was a big deal when Fulgrim kills Ferris Manus at the drop site. Uh, he. You know, he hits him with the with the big hammer and, and rips his head off. And then um, it was like this huge world. I think like, you know, energy was released like uh, space Marines are driven to their knees or knocked down by it. It's this big thing. Mm. But then when he's killing the clones, it's just like business as usual. Nothing. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Can I can I address one? I, I hate to do this, but you no. wanted somebody in your super chat did bring up something uh, talking yeah, yeah. about the uh, Astronomicon, right? Uh, and that if the Emperor goes, that goes. And then where's the lighthouse for humanity going to be? Because they all need that to basically find Earth or to keep keep things together. Again, that's where the Tyranids come in. If you can find an alternate way of traveling without having to use the warp and having to have any of that system in place, you don't need that anymore, and you don't need the Emperor anymore. So again, just this is heresy. No, this, yeah. this is heresy. <laughs> I'm just all I'm saying is maybe you Horace consult with Zeno. This is unacceptable. Maybe, maybe Horace wasn't completely wrong. <laughs> maybe <laughs> wait right a minute. Here. Wait a minute. This is dangerous. <laughs> I got. I got to stop you, Jim. We're gonna get thrown off of YouTube. Uh, <laughs> you can't. <laughs> you can't be talking good about Horace. That's the. That's the. That's the holocauster of the 40K. Can't well, do I mean, that. If, if Horus had done what he had done, but he wasn't influenced or influenced by uh, the Immaterium, right? If he wasn't influenced by that, if the Chaos Gods hadn't kind of given him that desire, you know what I mean? If he had just done it because he thought it was right, would it really be as bad a heresy? Like if somebody just came forward and said, we've got to fix this shit. We can't continue in perpetuity doing what we're doing. We have to, we have to, we have to ditch the dead weight. Right. Well, it's all Magnus's fault, even though Magnus did nothing wrong, because 
with I mean the uh what was it? The Thousand Suns didn't need astropaths, right? Like they just piloted their ships by them yeah. by themselves. Or not they didn't need navigators. They just would yeah. pilot their ships through the warp and uh and they would use some sorcery mixed with some psycherness and they could do it. Um but because because Magnus pissed off the emperor, he made a stupid decree uh at Nikea and uh and ruined everything going forward because they they really didn't need they didn't need the astronomicon although i think the astronomicon the uh what is it i can't remember the name of it but he's created basically like a the theory is like a, a demon of the emperor in the war yeah it's uh, it's like an avatar of his of his uh, people's belief in him mirrored in the warp you know? yeah so, and that that thing's weird um, yeah he uh, should what, kill more. are you talking about celestine the the Not angel girl no, not Celestine. The uh, the one that came out in the Aramon books. Um, oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I just envisaged that it was just kind of his soul in general, you know, like just darting around as he does because his 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 mind shattered into shards. The Emperor, so he he helps some people because he's all over the place, but he can't help them that well because he's not very powerful. Uh, that that was my. I know what you're talking about, but that was right. how I saw it. Now, was the the Void Dragon? Um, sorry, I'm I'm jumping way back, but we were talking That's about fine. the the Catan and uh, and the Void Dragon on on Mars. But wasn't he like supposed the Void Dragon, or at least a shard of the Void Dragon, was supposed to be the uh, the George and the Dragon story? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. And and so the Emperor's already faced down a Catan. Um, are we? Well, no, no, he, he faced down a portion uh, of one. Yeah. Let's be okay. I don't think a full grown one doing its thing is like because. It, it, when the old ones are fighting the Necron and the Catan, like they're getting their shit kicked, right? Like, I yeah. mean, this was an unstoppable force. If if they hadn't decided to go into what was it, cryo sleep or whatever they call it, yeah, they just got sleeping. Right? They they decided, <laughs> hey, they decided, hey, we're so good at dominating everything. We need to take a break and give these losers a chance <laughs> at recuperating for a minute. Yeah. Uh, so, I, I oh god, and I had a question related to this too. I was gonna I was gonna ask you. Um, and now it just completely slipped my mind. It was about the Void Dragon. Hopefully it pops back in. I'll ask it later if I can remember it, because it kind of played into this. Well, I was just wondering, uh, so uh, Border Prince, you were saying that the Emperor's, like, his mind is in shards, it's shattered. Um, I, I'm wondering if they're going to, like, retcon him into some sort of... Because, like, originally, the Emperor was the Emperor. And then, mm -hmm. and then later, the Emperor was a being created by the, like, combined sacrifice of all of the Psykers on earth in some primordial day uh and and like some shamanistic culture they they all did that and then combined into this thing um mm. so now i don't i don't know they've been changing so much of the backstory because it's it's so loose and they can make it is the emperor what? going to be a Catan or is he going to be oh, that, now that would be now, that would be fantastic actually <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you the theory that um one of the authors came out with he said that gw wouldn't let him um, but he said he wanted to make the Emperor into a, a a rogue AI that had survived from the Dark Age of Technology and just was able to uh, trick humans into believing he was, you know, a godlike being. And it's actually like a, a rogue AI from, from back then before the wars in the Age of Strife that had survived and determined that the only way to, it was still following its programming to protect humanity. And this, it determined that this was the best way to do it. That's, that's that's the best story. Yeah, yeah. Said that he, he wasn't allowed to do that. Oh, the irony um, of that would have been great because then the Martians would have loved it. He really is the Omniscient. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but everybody else would have hated him. <laughs> yeah. But, oh, uh, no, that's what I was going to ask. Uh, relating to the Catan, maybe you can, because uh, you might know the lore a little bit better than I do. Uh, when the Eldari trickster god, right? Because he was the one that got the Catan to start going after each other. Yeah. Um, so what exactly is that? That's the, like, when it relates to their gods, that's the thing that's always kind of slightly confused me. Is this an actual corporeal being? Is this like a chaos God or like a, a sub chaos God? What exactly were their, their gods? What is the trickster God? Well, I don't know. I don't know. I, I think they're just sort of playing off that it's a, it's a mix of mythology that the elder don't fully understand. You know, it's, it's like maybe there were warlords back then. Uh, maybe they were old ones. Uh, who were leading them and giving them this direction as because the old ones created the Eldar and most of the other races. It's like uh, they've left it loose enough that they can basically do anything. So basically yeah, whatever an author wants to do. I got to stop you here. You're completely wrong on this. Oh, um, oh no. Actually, it's uh, the, tri <laughs> the trickster god is Shurgarath and they're releasing Skyrim again. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <is that it? laughs> 
I need that DLC. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's a Skyrim DLC for 40k. Uh, <laughs> thank God. Thank God. Give me a bolter so I can just finish this stupid game already. Um, <laughs> no, it's uh, yeah, that that the whole the that's what that's what really has sunk its fangs into me is the war in the heavens uh, a long time ago. The timeline on it is so weird too, because like uh, the, the fall of the Eldar and the destruction of that. I mean that if we're, if we're taking 40 K timeline to literally now, if we're trying to linearly apply it to reality, um, the Eldar are still ruling the galaxy. Right. And, and the fall of the Eldar will happen in something like 10,000 to 15,000 years. And then they'll create Slanesh. Mm -hmm. um it's a it's such a weird sort of thing to think about how they've how they've gotten all this stuff going but yeah i i don't know how they're gonna how they manage this because they're 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 painting themselves into weird corners and maybe this is a good thing we've got to we've got to address the the question of primaris marines uh, uh and and <laughs> i guess the new the the way they're advancing the story because I always thought that the Horus Heresy was a way that they they could avoid advancing the 40k story and leave it in limbo for a while. But then they did that. They let the heresy go for about five years, and then they they decided, no, we're gonna we're gonna move forward now um, with the main timeline. And so I guess uh, I guess uh, Jim, are you are you familiar with Primaris Marines and the uh, the new developments with Robute coming back? No, like the newer stuff, I, I'm not familiar with. Like I said, I, I just started getting back into the lore, um, and especially like picking up my own omnibuses and novels and stuff. And like, just I've focused more on like uh, kind of stuff like the past. Like again, War Farm Again, which is fucking uh, fantastic. Debs yeah. Coden does a really, really great job with that. Um, no, I'm it, walk me through it. Explain to me where I didn't even know the Tau had created a diversity god, so I got them off the loop. <laughs> okay, and I let didn't me... know there was a space train with an oven fueling it either. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me let me take you through this a little bit, and then Border Prince, uh, if you can correct where I'm wrong and yeah, and help out with this. Uh, so of course, after the heresy, Robute gets mad and decides to go kill all of his brothers that are traitors. Um, but he fights, he ends up, he kills, well, maybe, he, maybe he kills either Alpharius or Omegron. Um, we're not really sure if they're actually dead. <laughs> that's what the one used to think. <laughs> yeah, that's what they, I, I think, uh, I think Omegron is in the Omega Vault. Uh, I think that'd be way cooler if he was in the Omega Vault of the, the Grey Knights. But we, we can talk about that later. So he goes and kills him, and then he goes after Fulgrim. And Fulgrim, uh, I think, wounds him with the lair blade. Am I right? Yeah. yeah he, no, no. He, I think he stabs him in the throat with it. Yeah. Yeah. It's either that or his tail. I can't re quite remember. Yeah. So he sticks. He sticks Robute in the throat, and Robute is they. He's alive, but they put him in stasis, and he stays in stasis for something like eight thousand years, just sitting there, not healing, not doing anything, and then, uh, and then Cipher teams up with an Eldar. And this is where it gets really weird. He teams up with an <laughs> Eldar and a Grey Knight who should have murdered Cypher and the Eldar outright because he's a Grey Knight and they're funny, but he doesn't do it. And they go on a quest. They invade McCrag and they actually go put on a Xenos technology breastplate and bring Robute out of stasis and that the Xenos thing heals him completely. And, uh, and he comes back using this heretical technology. And this is the good boy, Primark, remember? Like, uh, the most down with daddy's orders. And then he goes, and he's like, oh, yeah, by the way, uh, I'm gonna go talk to this, uh, I, I don't remember the Mechanicus guy, but turns out the Emperor had been working on Space <coughs> Marine Plus Ones, um, called Primaris Marines, and they maybe had a chapter kind of of test subjects lurking around, but then he puts them into mass production and starts just making uh, super super space marines um, all over the place. And now they're being deployed into various chapters, I guess, as they go. Uh, and and so it's it's weird because this is like all of this Xenos technology and heresy being just straight added into the most good boy Primarch and the good boy Legion like fronting this i did i miss something in that border prince um, yeah uh, well th there's the arch magus belisarius call that's, that's the, right that's yes the 
Thank you. Um, so Gillam, before he died, he tasked him with creating a pure form of Primaris. That's where they started out. But yeah, I mean, fundamentally correct, but it's worse with the uh, the Eldar thing. So Belisarius made this, his armor suit is like a, a life support system as well. So that's that's his armor. Uh, that's what it's for. Um, the, 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 the bad thing with the Eldar is that she used the spirits of all of the collective dead of the Eldar to heal Gilliman. That's that's <laughs> that's just, the messed up thing. It's not just heresy. It's I don't know necromantic heresy from this. Well, ne- I, I thought, necromantic I thought, Zenos heresy. Yeah, yeah. I, I thought the spirits you're talking about the craft were the ones that they were putting towards. Yeah, the she sucked them up. You say. So are they? Oh wait, are they used up now? Because they didn't have a lot of power to begin with. A lot of them. A lot of them. They, they, the collective dead of all of the Eldar was used to create this avatar of uh, Yinev, uh, the the god of the dead. Um, so yeah, that's that's what happened. And this woman, uh, is it Yinev who's the woman? I forget. That Yinari's the god. Yeah, the Yinari is the god of the Eldar dead. Um, her avatar, her champion, is this Yinev, and she went there and used Eldar ghost powers to uh, heal Gilliman. So it's it's doubly heretical. I so, love it. That's yeah. fantastic. Way to <laughs> way to mind fuck everyone with that one. Pretty yeah. much. So the the question then, of course, becomes is. Uh, and, and I'm wondering if Games Workshop has the balls to pull this off. Is Robute like a sleeper Xenos agent that is uh, that is going to be influenced by the heresy involved? <laughs> and is he going to turn? And are the Primarch or the Primaris Marines, are they are they just a uh, basically an insurrection that's that's waiting to be triggered by some some Eldar word that'll, you know, Tip the tip the scales on them and and suddenly turn them all crazy into murderous uh, rampaging beasts. You're talking about like some galactic Manchurian candidate that's just yeah. waiting, <laughs> yes. waiting to be given the go ahead. Yeah. What if he goes into the? I mean, he's already been granted access to the Emperor. Yeah, um, and that was an amazing scene. I you've read it, right? The Dark Imperium novel. When no, he, I haven't. I oh really. Oh God, it's I've, it's the way he describes it. Like the Emperor discovers that he's he's found a tool that he thought lost. How he how he describe? I can't remember the exact wording, but it's just the Emperor's just like, "Oh, you're alive! Fantastic!" Boom, enters his mind. You've got to do this. You've got to do this. You've got to do this. And Gilliman walks out like gutted because he used to think of him as his father, and he realizes now that he's just a tool to the Emperor, which is <laughs> it's brilliant. But he gives him his sword, so you know, it that's is something the, at least. The sword is is. Flaming harder than Siegfried and Roy, so that's good. Uh, but, but yeah. So then he creates the Primaris Marines, and of course, this is uh, at the same time that the the Thirteenth Crusade, Black Crusade, because uh, White Crusades aren't successful. Um, mm-hmm. The Thirteenth Black that's Crusade great. comes in <laughs> and uh, breaks Cadia, and and they're making their way. I guess not towards Terra, or they're really roundabout. I'm 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 dark onto why they. Why they can't? Uh, why they? Why they're not going straight for Terra on this? Uh, because they'll lose. Um, but Abaddon knows that like the collected forces will all gather up and kill them. But what Abaddon tried to do? Um, there's a book called Throne Alloys or uh, the Emperor's Legion, and it goes into this. Uh, Abaddon's plan was he sent a bunch of like stealthy fleets towards Terra before the fall. And they had Blackstone Fortress Rock, uh, Blackstone Rock, uh, giant things like in their ships ready to shoot down into the planet because the Blackstone would cut Terra off from the warp. So in all the planets and systems around Terra, they deployed all these massive stones, you know, just launching these ship-sized hunks of Blackstone onto the planets so that it would create a... um, It would cut Terra off from the wider warp. So the Emperor would be cut off, the Astronomicon would be cut off. They wouldn't be able to... The fleets from Terra wouldn't be able to move out, and they only just managed to stop it at the last place. They were uh, planning to do this ritual. Um, so yeah, I, he that, was planning on cutting that off and then gradually taking the Imperium over. Is that Vigilus? No, no, that's uh, that's uh, the Custodes novels that came out recently um, by Chris Wright. Uh, oh, yeah, man. Uh, Emperor's Legion, Emperor's Legion. I gotta read. I gotta read that one because I love. Yeah, the it's Custodes. quality. Custodes yeah, are fantastic. Yeah. That's the one that explains why where the Sisters of Silence come back into the Imperium as well. So it's definitely worth it. Definitely. 100%. Um, not a lot of people have read it. It seems to have just sort of gone under the thing, but it's one of the most important books in the current setting. <laughs> no one seems to have read it. Which but one is that? Which, which Emperor's, is Emperor's Legion, I think it is. is have you got that a, one? I God, I don't know. Did they do a special edition? 
Maybe. I'll listen to this. Rub it in a little more. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I know. Watches of the, the paper bags. Well, the, Watches of the Throne, Emperor's Legion. That's the one. The, uh, oh, yeah. I've got that one. Uh, Have you read this one yet? No, I haven't read it. It's right here. Read it, man. Read it. Read it tonight. They did do They did do a special edition, right? Yeah, of course. <laughs> Cheeky sod. Look at that, man. Sorry. Uh, I Well, because uh, I stopped. I stopped having a ton of time to read these things. Mm. So I stopped buying the paperbacks uh, that were coming out and I stopped buying the hardbacks because um, I was buying all of them in paperback. I have a bunch down, down on the lower shelves, uh, but I stopped buying those because I, I would just, if I got a chance, I would read an ebook cause I'd be on a plane or something. Yeah. But um, the, I, I always buy the special edition. So um, I'll have to, that's a good one. You say, I'll have to read it. Um, I'll change the order. The last one I read was Lords of Silence, which was really good. Oh, amazing. Amazing. Um, yeah, Jim, if you haven't read that, you need to read that. Skip everything else and read yeah, that. Yeah, I've already gone into debt buying books. Like, <laughs> 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 you know, I've got so much to get through. Uh, I got the Eisenhorn trilogy. Um, God, I, I like people came up with a list of everybody's like, you got to get this, you got to get this, you got to get this. I bought a bunch of them, but it gets spendy. And like, you're talking special editions and hardcovers and, <laughs> I'm like well, <laughs> together to get the paperbacks from used bookstores. Yeah, it's uh well it's it's my one my one uh collectible hobby that I do. Um I you know, so that's that's why that's how I justify it at least. That's what I tell my wife. It's like this is the one thing I buy, leave me alone. Uh but uh no, she likes them because the the they really do a ridiculously good job on how the books look. And so as long as I've got books that actually are, are appealing to look at on a shelf, my, my wife is, you know, she doesn't give me any grief about it. Um, <laughs> I don't know that she knows I spent like $300 on solar war yet, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but no, so I, I will check that out. The custodies are, are fantastic. Yeah. I'd like to talk about them and kind of the, the stuff, but what I wanted to ask first, I'll do another interview question. This one, I'll start with Jim. Uh, Jim, who's your favorite Primarch? Oh, it, start with him first. Oh, <laughs> it's a question already, everybody wants answered, Jim. They're already they're already fucking screaming heresy at me in the chat. For my <laughs> my thoughts on <laughs> alien races on the Xenos and what should be done to the Emperor. Start with him first. <laughs> All right, Border Prince, who's your favorite that, that, Primark? I'm telling that British stream that I did, I lost like 200 subs. I'm probably going to lose 200 more answering your question. So. <laughs> you, weren't, you weren't wrong, Jim. You weren't wrong. You were completely right. <laughs> I, I, I had to unsub. I'm sorry, though, in principle. Oh, hurtful. hurtful. <laughs> Um, I don't know. They're, they're all fantastic uh, to a different degree. I mean, the Night Haunter is is the most baller one. I really like Perturabo. Uh, the Iron Warriors are a fantastic legion and him and what he's done, he's just like a stroppy teenager who just wants to be recognised for how awesome he is, but no one does. Um, I go with, I go with more the traitor Primarchs myself. They've got a bit who's, more flavour to them. Maybe a more interesting question is, uh, which Primarch is the biggest cuck? Like, who sucks the most? Oh, no, that is a question. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, we know it's Fulgrim, obviously, if we're just talking about who sucks the most. Yeah, literally. But, um, literally, yeah. Fulgrim's eating D all day. <laughs> oh, he loves it. He loves it, man. Um, I don't know. It's, who can say? The, uh, it'd be Rogel Dawn, wouldn't it? I mean... He's he's the least interesting Primarch to me. I got to agree with you. I know, yeah. I know a lot of people like him, and that's fine, but I don't know if his story just isn't fleshed out enough for me. But all the other ones seem more interesting. Yeah. He uh, hasn't got much character to it. I mean, he has, but not as much as everybody else. Um, but if, like, literally in terms of getting cooked, I mean, he's, the Iron Cage destroyed his legion in the aftermath of the heresy. So Gilliman just took over the Imperium because Rogaldun didn't have the strength to oppose him and had to take on, you know, he had to go by the Index of Starties. He had to take that on and break his legion apart, which he never wanted to do. You know, um, yeah, he, he, that that was that was it. He literally got broken and screwed over after all of his sacrifices. <laughs> yeah. Do you think he's dead, or do you think? I mean, they're going to retcon him to be alive. Yeah, blatantly. Yeah, every all the Primarchs are going to come back to life. Now I they mean, they started that with Paris. The, they started it with the Beast, right? Because in the mm. Beast, Vulcan says to uh, slaughter before Vulcan mm. goes to fight the Beast. He said, or well, you know, you know what I mean. Before Vulcan goes to that uh, Titanic clash. He basically says to Slaughter, like, I will, 
when I see your when I see Dorn again, I'm going to tell him about you. Right. And so the implication is that Dorn isn't dead. He's just floating around somewhere like yeah. uh, like some sort of weirdo. Uh, well, the law was he, he, he died. He got he disappeared in a boarding action. He jumped on a ship trying to take it. And then the ship fled into the warp. And that was the last I saw of him. And then somehow they recovered his hands, apparently. But uh, yeah, I don't know. It's it's not been hammered out what actually happened to him. And we haven't got to that point yet in heresy or anything. So, you know, right. we'll see, I guess. I mean, he, he is going to be alive though. GW will bring them all back. They're trying to bring back Sanguinius. That I just don't think they've figured out how quite to do it yet, but they blatantly will. Blatantly. <laughs> yeah, they, they have to. Oh, okay, Jim, best and worst I'm, primarchs. I'm, I'm, uh, Listen, like I'm hearing all these names, but I'm not hearing the right name. Okay, I'm like a teenage white girl from the suburbs. I like me a bad boy. Right, so <laughs> I'm going to go for uh, Horace. Oh, Horace. Horace. Listen, I, I, like, I like, you know, I like a wrench getting thrown into the machine. Okay. I like a little bit of fucking chaos. I like a little bit of heresy. I think that's probably apparent by now. <laughs> when you ask my, my viewpoints on the, uh, the Empire, uh, when you ask my viewpoints on the Emperor himself, I just, I, like, I get it. I get it's heresy. I get it's heretical. But Horace is my boy. You know, that's a better choice than Lorgar. Because, uh, let's be real, Lorgar's a bitch. Pretty much. <laughs> yeah. I'm, reading, I'm reading chat. Like, a couple of people were saying that he's uh, referring to him as a cuck. Yeah, Lorgar. Uh, here, here's the funny thing about Lorgar. When Malkador, the Emperor... I, I don't know if the Emperor was even there. It was like Malkador and, uh, and Gilliman show up at Monarchia. And Malkador mind, mind rapes all of the... Uh, all of the, whatchamacallit, the word bearers and makes all of them kneel. All of them kneel. All of them at the same time. <laughs> just this, this little frail old Walmart greeter making all of them kneel. And then uh, and then Lorgar like hits Gilliman and Gilliman just stands there and is like, are you done yet, you petulant child? And he's like, oh, Lorgar sucks. <laughs> mm, pretty much. Pretty much. And he, he almost gets killed by... Uh, Actually, this is one of my favorite Primarch scenes. Lorgar only get almost gets stepped on by a Titan. Um, and and Angron catches the Titan's foot and holds it. Like, cause uh, Angron's my favorite Primarch, because he's he's just funny. He's so pissed off all the time that I can't I, <laughs> I can't get over it. And oh listen to, listen to this shit in your chat. He was weak. They're telling me he was weak because he got dominated by chaos. No, okay. He was thinking outside the box. All right. <laughs> Sometimes yeah. you gotta take a new approach to solve a problem. Hey, Horace, Horace was uh, you know, he was brought low. He was brought low in a cheap shot. Uh he was he was screwed over by by a nerd that he trusted, Erebus. Never trust, never trust a weirdo like Erebus. And it's uh true. And that's that's what happened. You know, it wasn't it wasn't Horace's fault. It wasn't. Oh, Horace's see, I should have I should have read chat more. I should have went with Mandar. Clearly, the, the proper <laughs> choice for bringing the fucking darkness. <laughs> but uh, so okay, so then um, I guess moving on from the Primarchs, though, uh, my favorite people always ask me my favorite Legion, and it changes like every time I answer it. I think right now it's Salamanders. Uh, I really like salamanders as a legion. They're funny to me. They're funny because they they're uh, and and this is I mean I guess this makes them the biggest cucks. But they're willing to sacrifice themselves for humans, which is weird. Um, Nonsense. <laughs> but but also uh, Vulcan Hastan is really funny because he's he just runs around killing things by himself. It's like we're gonna take one space marine who's like tougher than all of the other ones. We're gonna give him three of Vulcan's weapons, and he's just gonna go around the galaxy killing stuff for fun. Um, so I like that, but, uh, but my favorite, my favorite army is the custodes. Uh, they're to me, they're the most interesting sort of faction that exists in all of 40 K. Like I love gray Knights, um, uh, but custodes is the, cause each one of them is handmade. Um, apparently, although I don't yeah. know how they keep like keep up numbers with the emperor gone. So do you, do you, do you know anything about that? I have no idea how they keep making them or do they keep um, making them? I, I assume they've got the same sort of just, uh, gene, you know, gene, gene modification things they had before the heresy, but you're right. They all are, they all have a, a bit of the emperor's uh, genetic code in, in them. He's their primarch essentially. Um, 
But yeah, the, the, the custodians are just amazing. They are individual warriors. Each one of them would be a, a warlord of his time if he was just born in, on a different planet. Um, Except for Saturnalia. That guy well, sucks. <laughs> that was the worst custodian of all time. He got beat up by a generic space marine. It's yeah okay. He wasn't a good representation, but the guy who went against uh, you know in First Heretic, the guy who just like cut up you know twenty odd space marines in that cave on Cadia. Yeah, was um, that uh, was that Constantine? Yeah, Constantine. Yeah, or uh, is it is it, is the sword equivalent? Is that what he had? The sword equivalent. But yeah, that guy he just he pulls his spear out and he just hacks these word bearers to pieces, and it's it's amazing. Um, those guys are brilliant. First Heretic is the best heresy book by by far. Um, these custodians just laughing at how weak Lorgar is, just watching him talk to his legion. They're just laughing at him. why are we stuck with this weakling Primarch? Everybody yeah. else is getting glory. I'm gonna I'm gonna disagree with you, but I'm gonna hang on to my recommendation oh. for best her uh, best heresy book in a little okay. bit. Okay, okay. But uh, Jim, are you familiar with the custodians, the uh, the guardians of the emperor? Well, you were at, well, you you skipped over me. You're asking which which legion. We like oh, that. yeah. What legion? Oh, right. Sorry. I apologize. What legion? Oh, do you like? yeah. Don't let the heretic answer. Which one do you think? Luna Wolves. Are you going gonna to go with Luna Wolves? Yes. The Sons of Horus. Yeah. Come on. Ah, oh, come on. What, what, do you, what the fuck do you think I'm going to say? They're the Chaos Ultramarines. Yeah. The Sons of Horus were weak. <laughs> All no, the shit talk. The, the, the Emperor's shit children talk. annihilated them, man. It's done, you know? They're broken. How's, how's the Emperor doing now? Oh, that's right. <laughs> it's all part of the plan. You don't no. understand. He's been planning this for a very long time. That's a great plan. Hey, yeah. I'm <laughs> actually I support for a billion years and get fed psycher souls <laughs> because I got my shit kicked in. <laughs> actually, though, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna agree with you to a point, Jim, because two two of my favorite Two of my favorite Space Marine characters are uh, Luna Wolves, uh, former Luna Wolves. You've got, you've got, uh, of course, uh, Garviel Loken, who is an absolute comedy of a character in the Horus Heresy, right? Um, and uh, and I do recommend reading through the the Horus Heresy because that the first three books at least are are absolutely wonderful. Um, you've got uh, what were the first the first three was um, Horus Rising. Uh, Oh, crap. I don't remember the next two titles, but no, uh, me neither. No, but you've they're basically the trilogy of how it all kind of kicks off. And Garviel Loken is at the center of it. Um, yeah. and he's great and he comes back later. Spoiler alert, sorry. Uh, but he comes back later. But then the other one is the uh, the other Luna Wolf from Terra. He was the one who was stuck in um, he was stuck in Terran prison when they found out about the the traitor legions. Oh god, yeah, yeah. I can't remember his name, but he's oh, he's like a latent psyker, and as long as he concentrates, like people can't see him. That guy is freaking cool too, uh, and he's a monster. So I'm, I'll give you I'll give you Luna Wolves. I like them. Um, Thank you. Who's see, the <laughs> heresy, heresy is not so terrible, is it? No, no, no. Who's the worst legion though? What? Oh, fuck. I, I don't know. I don't know how to answer that question. Is it, do they go by the name Luna Wolves? No, not, no, no, they, no. No, 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 just... do they, no. Do they go by the name Luna Wolves? Or, if, if yes, um, <laughs> not terrible. If no, uh, they can suck a big dick. <laughs> <laughs> I see what you're saying. I, okay, so you're saying any other Legion. All of the others are just so subpar. That's, you know, I gotta be, I gotta speak truth here. I gotta speak my speech. What can I, I don't... say? <laughs> I actually don't like space wolves, personally. Really? Um, what is it? What is it that doesn't mesh with you? What is it? Uh, is they're it too. Viking? They're too generically Viking for me. Like they're. It's. Uh, I find them to be the least creative legion. Although I'm going to contradict myself when I mention what the best heresy book is. But uh, the what, what is it? Maybe. You can oh, Prosper with... Burns. Is this what you're going to say? No, not Prospero Burns. The um, the uh, the one where the guy, uh, the Remembrancer is sent to. Oh Fenris. shit! Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. a great book. The whole thing is told through his perspective. He gets he almost dies, and they bring him back as like a modified, uh, scald or whatever. And the whole thing is told from his perspective. I love that book. I really did. Wash his skin, Nick. They take his skin off and wash it for him. That's, <laughs> what, that's what the elite are doing right now. It's glorious. <laughs> <laughs> that was well, I, I, I think I've done my job here. I mean, not only am I a heretic, but I like, as chat's referring to it, the space furries is what I've not been <laughs> designated as, uh, as, as being for. 
Um, but no, I, I actually do have to jump. I've got a, a dental appointment early in the morning. So uh, this was enjoyable. I wish uh, more people would be on my side of this. I, I do think, you know, <laughs> I think I think maybe, you know, I'm just saying maybe a little heresy isn't too terrible. Okay. Well, I mean, you you do like space furries, so the heresy is. Uh... I, well, that would explain it, wouldn't it? You know, right. Why I have such shit opinions, but um, I, I am interested to see where it goes. I, I do like. It just feels like everybody's position to kind of take it in a, their own kind of direction. I, I really, again, the whole god of diversity thing. I didn't know about that, so that it's is glorious. Yeah, that is amazing to me. That is absolutely amazing to me. I'm I'm curious, like, will anybody try to exploit the Tyranids and their travel techniques uh you know what, what are the eldari gonna do <laughs> what are the eldari gonna do um you know and then of course you've got necrons and their little living metal shells with their magical space dragon energies and you know it just there, there's a lot of directions it can go and that's the thing that's always attracted me to it and things like it is when you've got so much crazy shit going on and it's so absurd and it's so over the top that's what makes it fun that was always the appeal to me um, you know, I wish I could have got more into the tabletop game, but I'm an impatient person <laughs> and like, you know, kind of building it and putting it together and painting it and stuff is like, it, it, it that's a lot to invest into it. But I, I always enjoyed watching people kind of get into it. Well, it's, uh, it, the, the lore is way more uh, appealing to me. And I mean, with the amount of books I've got, I, I'm going to be able to recite retarded facts. Nobody has any idea what I'm talking about by the time <laughs> I'm doing it. Uh, but, you know, I look forward to that because, you know, it's just, it's good fiction and it's really good fun. And I hope, I hope GW doesn't screw it up. And I hope like uh, marketing and PR doesn't take it into a, let's have a broader appeal by, I, I don't know, by, by trying to appeal to people that aren't interested in, in the first place and kind of pissing off the fans. You know what I mean? So. You, uh, I, you you mentioned all the painting and, and building the models, but really, like the the two hours of bo infusion on a Sunday that's the real problem. That's no, uh, that's the real that's investment. Uh, I don't know. You kind of become you kind of become desensitized to it. Like if you've ever sat through a D and D campaign that lasted for more than I don't know, like an eight hour play session, the smells that are coming off of that man, like you can't, <laughs> you couldn't, you couldn't pick a piece of poetry that comes close to describing what that is. So, you know, I, I could, I could tolerate that, but uh, thanks for having me on. Uh, I enjoyed the conversation again, uh, chat. You're wrong. Horace is the proper answer. Oh, uh, fuck the emperor. Welcome to the new wow. reality. Wow. Kick him. Kick him. <laughs> <laughs> All right, buddy. Thanks. Thanks for hanging out with us tonight. And you have a you have a good dental appointment. <laughs> yeah, fun times. All right. Take it easy, guys. Later, man.